Due Process, recipient of six Mid-Atlantic Emmy Awards. It's spreading. It's just it's just kind of making its way from my back into my legs, into my brain stem, um, as, and, and into my face and mouth. The pain, she says, is unrelenting. But she thinks there could be an answer. The problem is, it's illegal. Medical marijuana on this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, a private foundation focusing on New Jersey public policy issues. Additional funding provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual and online legal reference, elaw.com. Marijuana. The U.S. Supreme Court this term will consider it. The legislature in this session may vote on it, but it's not about getting high. I'm Raymond Brown, and on this edition of Due Process, medical marijuana. Should it be legal? Does it work? We'll hear from the sponsor of a pending Senate bill that could lift the ban here in New Jersey, from an anti-drug activist lawyer and from a professor of health care law who will help us get the national picture. But first, as always, here's Sandy King with the human face of the issue. Raymond, if the state bill is successful, New Jersey could become the 11th state to say yes to marijuana. Not for recreational use, but for the chronically ill, whose doctors say it could help. Marijuana, some claim, can be good essential medicine. And that's a far cry from that old image of reefer madness fueled by killer weed. Hey! What do you want? Bring me some reefers. It's been 70 years since this celluloid image of killer weed, an image these days more likely to draw laughter than fear. Play faster. Faster. In reefer madness, it led to insanity, suicide, even murder. He is hopelessly and incurably insane, a condition caused by the drug marijuana to which he was addicted. But while not even its most adamant foes, make those kind of claims today. Marijuana, according to federal law and New Jersey law, is still illegal. It's not right that we, we could have all been arrested. Distributors and users can be and are still arrested and jailed. And the law makes no exemption for those whose intent isn't to get high. Found one of his pipes, put some pot in there, lit it up for him, and he, he, took, he inhaled one sign, but then he sort of nodded that was enough. It was the high sign. And about an hour later, he died. He was 28 years old when a vicious cancer took his music career, his wedding plans, his life. Here someone is dying, in the process of dying, and we're trying to think that maybe a last drag might, might ease his pain or suffering, anxiety, whatever, and yet it's illegal. And Sean McGrath's parents say they just can't understand why even his final minutes were marred by the threat of criminal prosecution. He could have been arrested right at that spot, but also everybody else in the room. And that really hit me as strange. So strange, in fact, that it turned Sean's parents into activists, fighters for the cause of compassionate use of cannabis, of medical marijuana. The experience of thousands of individuals has demonstrated that it is only the use of the natural marijuana which alleviates uh, their symptoms. That's extremely important. And Roberta Massey thinks it could be important for her, a way of controlling the intractable neuropathic pain 
that she lives with every day. I can feel the burning in, this, in the leg. It's almost like a vise is clamped around it. Morphine, she says, turns her into a zombie. Lesser pain killers, she insists, don't work. Not even the Marinol that her doctors prescribed. Marinol is a marijuana extract, but when they do the extraction, they lose an awful lot of, of properties of, of natural marijuana. So it doesn't really do anything. I haven't had any luck with this at all. She's heard that the real thing would be different. But Roberta says she's afraid to try it and has no way to get it, so long as it remains illegal. If I could get marijuana tomorrow, I probably would try it. And I think the marijuana would do it. And this doctor says she may be right. But he says it's not so simple as making it legal. Or not. I would not uh, at this time support the use of medical marijuana uh, for the simple reason that it has not at this point been proven to be effective and safe. And in order to be proven to be effective and safe, we'd have to have a series of controlled clinical trials to establish its efficacy and safety. But when Sean McGrath's parents pitched a tent in their yard, a rally to launch a new legislative effort, there was no talk of medical trials. After all, marijuana has been proven to be safer than all the other drugs that doctors have prescribed legally and that have, people can overdose with and can die from. Feel like you're about ready? But the bill does provide for physician control. Written certification from a doctor that the medical use would outweigh the health risk for a seriously ill patient, a patient like Cheryl Miller. The spasticity all but disappeared uh, far more effective than Marinol, which is her otherwise most effective drug. We met Cheryl and husband Jim nine years ago when she was suffering the agonies of NS and he was fighting to find relief. If he could bring it home and, you know, make brownies, make stuff like that, because I can't smoke it, but I can eat it. Today, Cheryl is dead and Jim is still fighting. I, will advertise it. I don't want to see people feeling that they're at risk for being incarcerated or losing their home and their livelihood because they're trying to help a loved one get through their suffering. And like was in Sean's case, all we were doing was trying to help our son who was dying at the time. But should one family's anguish determine public policy? The McGraths say theirs is not just an isolated story, and they point to patients like Sean and caregivers like them who have been arrested, prosecuted, even jailed. Like glaucoma patient James Burton, who grew the weed on his Kentucky farm until he was busted and jailed, and finally homeless, since the judge had ordered his house and farm seized. He and his wife now live in the Netherlands, where his grass is legal and his glaucoma, he says, under control. That's the argument for legalization, but there are arguments on the other side, too, and we'll air them all here in the studio when we come back, so stay with us. For medical purposes, sure. Personally, I don't smoke, but you know, if it can help somebody, then sure. If it helped, then why not? Are they using other stuff to test people? Why not try marijuana? It would be prescribed by a doctor, and of course, uh, there'll probably be a abuse of uh, the use of the prescription. I'm sure, but uh, that happens. Once it gets started, that's it. Everybody's going to be selling it. Everybody's mother's going to be selling it. There's going to be all kinds of crime and stuff like that. I don't necessarily want to legalize it, but for medical use, yeah, definitely. I think it could be very useful and helpful. I think it's all right as long as they put, uh, make sure there are strict controls on it and uh, make sure that it doesn't get in the hands of uh, underage children or people who shouldn't be authorized to have it. Who am I to, to judge uh, who's right or who's wrong? But I don't, if you're asking me, I don't think it's right. 
And our informal poll, which showed a majority in favor of medical marijuana, supports a more scientific survey by none other than AARP, who found that 75% of Americans over 45 thought that medical marijuana made sense. Senator Nick Scutari, sponsor of the state Senate bill, says they're right. But David Evans, the executive director of Drug Free Schools Coalition in Flemington, is so sure they're wrong that he's filed an amicus brief in the case before the U.S. Supreme Court. And with us from Newark, Seton Hall Law Professor John Jacoby, the associate director of Seton Hall's Health Law and Policy Program. Welcome to you all. David, let me start from you. Uh, in the picture of human suffering that we saw in the beginning of the program. Those are pretty compassionate stories about people who are in some cases just on the verge of death looking to ease their last few days. Against that kind of suffering, what's the policy argument that says marijuana shouldn't be used as a medicine in that context? Well, that argument is very compelling and um, it hits us right in the core of our compassion for other people and that's why it's a very effective argument and that's why the people that are in favor of medical marijuana use that. Um, the people that are in favor of legalizing marijuana uh, are, uh, use that argument also. But you're skeptical about that argument. Well, uh, let me just say, first of all, I've been there. I'm a cancer survivor. And had I used medical marijuana with my form of cancer, I'd be dead today. And my wife would be without a husband, and my children would be without a father. So um, I was able at the time, I was very ill, very afraid. The type of cancer I had was a very virulent kind of cancer. And I was able to rely on documented scientific research to guide my decisions, getting the best care for myself. I've been cancer free now for six years. Had I listened to Angel Rach, who has this case before the United States Supreme Court, who has said publicly that marijuana shrinks tumors, if I'd listened to her, I'd be dead. So I think we have to be very careful about the information that we give to people who are in these desperate situations. And if we tell them that marijuana is medicine, it's the wrong information and it can kill people. But let me take this argument one step further. Let's get past somebody making a claim that probably no one in the medical community accepts, which is that it will shrink tumors, and look at the question of whether it can be a palliative to ease suffering at the end of a life, which is an area where there is some greater debate. Does your position change at all when we reduce the argument to the scope of area where most people believe medical marijuana should be Well, considered. I think the real issue here is are people getting managed medically properly? Now, this bill that's before the state legislature uh, does not just deal with that, you know, end of life, last few minutes of life situation, okay? This bill will authorize somebody over the age of 18 years old who has a doctor's certificate to possess up to one ounce of marijuana and six marijuana plants. All right. Okay. David, David's critique of your bill, Senator, seems to suggest that it's so broad that it doesn't focus on those cases where there is some question about the use of medical marijuana. Now, you're not a guy who's in, in whose political career we think of as pro-decriminalization. Indeed, you've been pretty conservative on those issues. What brought you to this point, and is David right in his critique? Well, uh, certainly there is some broadness to the bill, but that's for the doctors really to make their decision, a personal decision with the doctors and the patients, along with uh, the studies that support whatever the doctor believes they should have. Have. My position on it, and I'm a city prosecutor. I prosecute people for possession of marijuana all the time. We're not for one instance suggesting that the legalization of marijuana for recreational use is, is warranted or that we're suggesting that be done. What we're looking at is that doctors should be able to make relevant choices given what they know about what the condition is of the patient. Certainly the most compelling argument is people that are on their deathbed that are suffering from AIDS, that are suffering with uh, nuclear therapy and, and radioactive therapy. But there is also a case to be made that doctors believe that in certain pain syndromes and wasting syndromes that, that benefits of marijuana might be utilized. And if so, that would be up to a doctor to decide. Does your bill provide the kind of controls that can satisfy people whose criticism is exclusively that we might agree that there might be some use for it, but we think that it's a domino process, that once you prescribe it, it's going to be authorized or accessed by people who shouldn't have it? We believe there is sufficient controls. We're not going to allow people to go to work, to drive vehicles, to operate machinery, to be under the age of 18, and they have to have a certified doctor's certificate. And this can't just be from a one-time visit to a doctor. This would be a doctor that was under the care, that after other treatment alternatives have been evaluated and decided that those weren't proper, that the, then they could go to that type of uh, medication or medicinal marijuana if they believe it's warranted and only if they believe it's warranted. The other thing that I would say in defense of that argument is that there are 11 other states that have already 
prescribed medical marijuana to be of some use. And there have been no evidence that's been shown to me to believe that there's this, this effect of legalizing marijuana across the, across the board. I mean, is New Jersey any less progressive than, than California? Is it any less progressive than the other 11 states that have, that have done so? Right. John, let me bring you in. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case that led to the United States Supreme Court is a fairly nuanced legal opinion for lay folks to read. Uh, where does it come out or how does it affect this debate about the use of medical marijuana in the midst of Commerce Clause and other legal questions that are caught up in that decision? It really doesn't address David's concern that, that uh, the use of medical marijuana might be inappropriate. What the United States Supreme Court case is going to decide is who is the proper body to regulate the use of marijuana. Uh, what the, uh, the United States Supreme Court will decide is whether states will regulate medical marijuana as they regulate other medical procedures or whether that procedure uh, of administering marijuana will be subject to federal regulation. Uh, so it's a Commerce Clause argument, and the issue is whether the United States Congress overstepped its bounds in applying federal law to prevent states from allowing people who are terminally ill or very sick from getting access to marijuana, as, for example, they get access to opioids, codeine, and other uh, controlled dangerous substances. John, let me ask you an underlying question, then, is uh, if you go back to the beginning of our show, Sandy King started with the movie Reefer Madness, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you didn't see when it originally came out, but have subsequently seen, as have we all. And and the question is whether the discussion has moved from the kind of extreme positions at the time of reefer madness to a more sophisticated discussion actually measuring the benefits and harms. For example, have the states or federal authorities engaged in enough examination of the balance so that judgments can be made by legislators and the Congress and even the courts about the relative use, or are we still in the realm of rhetoric on the critical question? Well, there has been a, a fair amount of study of this issue. The Institute of Medicine issued a report in 1999 that pretty comprehensively analyzed the medical uses of marijuana, uh, deciding that probably the, the current data shows that the medical use of marijuana is appropriate. Ironically, a lot of people have complained that federal restrictions on the use of marijuana have restricted the ability of people to do good data analysis. David, let me ask you this question, uh, and let me ask you a hypothetical question, which I know you don't want to answer, as nobody does. But if you were satisfied that the medical community said there is a limited use for medical marijuana in some circumstances to relieve suffering, for example, and if you looked at a bill like Nixon and said, if we tinker here or there with the controls, we can make sure it doesn't get beyond the circle of those folks, I'm assuming that your objections would disappear, or is there a deeper policy or other concerns that drives the objection? No, my, my whole point is that we should follow our normal drug approval process in approving any medicine in this country. We shouldn't do it by emotion. We shouldn't do it by popular vote. And we should do it by people that are properly qualified to make that decision. This is an attempt to go to do an end run around our normal drug approval process. It's an attempt to do it by popular vote. What they did in those other states is that the organizations that were in favor of legalizing drugs put a lot of money, $30 million in California, okay, to get that resolution through, okay? So that's what happens. Now, let's, let's see what the doctors have to say. And uh, the professor was not accurate about that Institute of Medicine uh, report. Well, let's just look at what the, the medical associations say that have done detailed studies of this. American Medical Association is against it. National Multiple Sclerosis Association is against smoke marijuana. Glaucoma Society, Ophthalmology, Cancer, Society for Addiction Medicine, American Pediatrics, all against it. Institute of Medicine said that smoking marijuana is not the way to go. There may be compounds in marijuana. I'm going to get to your question. I have no problem with anything that goes through the normal drug approval process. I would support it. There already is a legal form of marijuana called Marinol. There's another drug also that's met FDA approval. Go through the normal drug approval process. Let's not rely on emotion. Making emotional medical decisions kills people, and that's not compassion. Would supporters of your bill be effectively subverting the normal process by which there is approval for new, new drugs? Well, this is about states' rights. And in this instance, there's been such a plethora of research. And I, and I do want to quote that Institute of Science Research where it says, until a, a non-smoked rapid onset cannabis drug delivery system becomes available, the si that, that, that study acknowledges that there is no clear alternative for people suffering with these chronic conditions to the smoking of marijuana. And, and that would be the beneficial use of it. So there has been 
11 other states that have utilized this as, a, as a, an, an effective means of combating and, and really showing compassion for people. And there's no reason why it hasn't been done here. And you're satisfied that that level of rigor responds to David's claim that really we're trying to shortcut the process by which any substance might be used medicinally. I don't believe we're shortcutting it. In fact, the, the, the federal government has already mandated or at least approved of marinol as a substance that could be used, which is a derivative of marijuana to begin with. Yeah. It's really the delivery system that doesn't allow for the relief of these patients. My recollection, and I'm far from an expert in this, John, is that the FDA process for drug approval can be a pretty lengthy one. It doesn't have to be a lengthy one. The, uh, the uh, last time that this question was raised was in 2001 when the Drug Enforcement Administration rejected a request to reschedule marijuana to make it a Schedule II drug which would permit physicians to prescribe it. They rejected that, finding that there was no medical use for marijuana. I think that if I can respond to something that David said, this is not subverting the normal process of law. In fact, the New Jersey legislature would simply be amending its, its drug laws. What it does uh, get to is the question of whether New Jersey, as a sovereign, will hold people responsible criminally for administering marijuana at the end of life or when they're extremely ill. The federalism issue comes up uh, when the federal government and the state government clash. Uh, and the, it's certainly within the power of New Jersey to change its drug laws. The question before the United States Supreme Court is whether it's within Congress's power to tell New Jersey it is not permitted to regulate medicine in this fashion. Let me ask you, Senator, what got you on this subject? What made you focus on the question of medical marijuana? Well, we've had a number of different constituents contact our office with respect to this issue soon after I got into office, and we did a lot of research and study with respect to it. And as people have brought up to me, that my mother suffers with multiple sclerosis and has never partaken in any of these illicit drugs for even medicinal use, although she believes in her mind that she might benefit from it. If it were legalized, would you urge her to consider it as a possibility? What I wouldn't urge her to do anything other than what she and her doctor believes would benefit her. And, and I think that that's really what, the, uh, what this is all about, is just giving another avenue of relief for people who are in the worst conditions in society. I mean, my, my argument is why wouldn't we do this for these people who are sitting home and suffering with chronic pain syndromes, losing their hair, losing their appetite from, from, from radioactive treatments? Why wouldn't we do this for these people if we can? Is there an answer to the question? Do you think there is a reason why? For example, David came to us recommended by the White House Office of Drug Policy Control. That is people who said, here's a guy who's thought a lot about this question. What do you see as the source of opposition to what seems to you to be a pretty logical way to go in terms of medicine? Well, I believe that people think it is a slippery slope towards legalization of drugs. And that's ne nothing that I've ever advocated for, nor would I advocate for, especially since I'm in law enforcement myself. But uh, with respect to people in terms of their very last days of life who are suffering from chronic pain, diseases where their doctors believe they might be helped by something, I don't see why we wouldn't have another avenue for them. David, is there a slippery slope concern on the part of some in your camp, broadly speaking? Are no, there people who oppose this all, because of a yeah, broader the, concern? The senator is misrepresenting what his bill does, first of all. It doesn't deal with those end-of-life cases. That isn't so. It would permit an 18-year-old in a college dorm to have up to six marijuana plants that could produce up to 13,000 joints a year. I've done the math. Uh, and if you look that, at With it, a doctor's prescription? Uh, well, with the doctor's recommendation, yes, and, and uh, well, is there that's a, a lot of marijuana. Are you concerned, David suggests that that's a large hole, that any doctor can make a prescription? Well, I, I believe that the, the, there's no misrepresentation to what this bill does. This gives doctors an opportunity to prescribe or under a doctor's care marijuana if it's utilized. And I don't believe the 18-year-old in the dorm room is going to be somebody that's going to be allowed to do doing this. I'm down to my last minute. You, you had something you wanted to show? You're, well, this is, this is the senator's bill would permit somebody to have an ounce of marijuana. That's, this is 36 camel cigarettes. That's an ounce. By the way, all the states, if you look at the states that have done this, they are all now in the top tier of states in okay. terms of drug use. I've got to slow us down because we're at the end right. of the time. I've got to ask you whether your bill is going to pass the legislature? Well, we're looking forward to a hearing and addressing all these issues. All right. And do you see more states adopting it? I've got to get close to yes or no. Adopting medical marijuana? Uh, I don't think so. I think people are now aware of it. I don't think it's going to pass in New Jersey legislature, and we're going to win in the Supreme Court. John, since you're an old friend, I'll ask you to do that, which is unreasonable. Predict what the United States Supreme Court is going to do. I think the Supreme Court will probably find that Congress does have the power 
to refuse to allow states to pass the well, kind of law that the Senate Then we'll be back to the states, and I guess we'll have to reconvene this discussion. With our thanks to David Evans, Senator Nick Scutari, and Professor John Jacoby, that's it for this edition of Due Process. But we hope you'll join us next week for another cutting-edge issue of Law and Justice. Till then, for Sandy Kane, all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching. that um, we should use the range of options we have to make people comfortable when they're when they're ill and I think that's a legitimate use. If it's gonna help, you know, medically, I don't see why not. No, I don't think that's a really good type of um, medicine. Because it's drugs. I've suffered from cancer and I know what the pain is. Some people have that opportunity to for glaucoma, cancer, ease relief of pain. It makes perfect sense. It's medicinal. I think it's narrow-minded and punitive not to let sick people who are in pain have the best thing available to help them relieve their pain. If it were legalized, then it, um, it, they would, it would be supervised, and as long as it was prescribed by a doctor, obviously they prescribe it because the, 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 client, the patient would need it. So yeah, why not? I, I wouldn't have a problem with it. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, a private foundation focusing on New Jersey public policy issues. Additional funding provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual and online legal reference, elaw.com.